When the camera's rolling, I like the danger in it. The heart pounds. It defies logic. It's thrilling to me. Football fans, the moment you've all been waiting for all season is right around the corner. And DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55, is bringing back their free prediction challenge. Up to $55 million in prizes are up for grabs. $55 million. And once you submit your picks, you get a free instant prize up to $25,000. If you have the most predictions correct, you can win top prize of $1 million. So make sure you download the DraftKings app now and fill out the free prediction challenge. Fill it out and answer questions like, who will score last, and get ready to make it rain. DraftKings has paid out over $7 billion to its players since 2012, so they know big paydays. Download the DraftKings app now and use the promo code SMOKE to enter the free $55 million Super Bowl challenge. That's code SMOKE, only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for more details. Welcome back, man. Season two of All the Smoke. We got a real special guest. What's up with your Brody with the virtual handshake? I'm going to tell y'all something that I never told nobody. I want all the smoke. Welcome back to another episode of All the Smoke. I'm frustrated right now. I can't even lie to you. It took me an hour to get my shit set up. That's why. I'm going to be, I'm gonna, just letting you know now, I'm going to be smoking this episode. I almost threw my fucking computer, but we're back. Jack, what's we're happening back. out there in Atlanta, bro? You good? Hey, my boy, it's a crazy day. Earlier it started off with me, now you. But look, we made it. And this is the episode, somebody we've been wanting yeah. on our show, Hell a musty yeah. episode. So go ahead and introduce yeah. my little bro, man. Man, welcome to the show, man. One of the hottest voices in sports right now, uh, NBA champion, and our brother, yes, Kendrick sir. Perkins, bro. Welcome to the show. Hey, man, look, I'm so motherfucking happy to be on here with some real <laughs> motherfuckers. But look, before, before we even get started, man, I got to tell y'all, boy. You motherfuckers is something serious, you hear me? You motherfuckers <laughs> doing big things. Now, real talk, real talk, man, because look, the, what y'all did in this year span, all the accolades and shit, man, I applaud that shit. I watch from a distance. Y'all don't even realize you two guys is the reason that I even got into the media because y'all bought that authenticity, that real shit. Well, I was like, hold on. All right, if Stack, who raised me since about the age of 14, if he on here and he's speaking that real shit, hell, a country boy from Beaumont, tax, Texas slash PA, Texas, because my wife from PA, what? I was actually born in PA. I was just yep. adopted in Beaumont. Shout out, PA. I said, I, I can go in this motherfucker and speak this old country broken English too, fuck. I ain't trying to look up. <laughs> look, I ain't, I ain't trying to look up no words in the encyclopedia. I ain't trying to do none of that, fuck. If I, if, if I, if I stutter... If I stutter, motherfucker, you understand what I'm talking about. You so big, so big. Yeah, man, this ain't English class. This motherfucking basketball right. we talk much. Straight up, straight yeah. up. Now, Perk, did Appreciate you ever it, think, I mean, with everything you just said, coming from where you came from, the route you took, did you ever think you would be one of the strongest voices in in, in the basketball community right now? I mean, you're, you're right at the top of the game. You're on every single ESPN show. I'm sure they're giving you some good bread. Did you ever think this was possible? I'm so proud. Nah, nah, nah to be honest, man, I actually got into this media shit, man, because, you know, I wasn't ready to retire, right? And I was forced to retire. So it's almost something like, what's next? I always kind of wanted to jump into the coaching. I actually wanted to be the next coach that was a big man, the next head coach that was a big that played in the game because I feel like big man get looked at as like we dinosaur brains or some mm -hmm. shit. Like we know the game just as much as anybody else. So I wanted to be a head coach. So I'm like, how can I do that? Let me get on, on, on TV and just speak basketball, you know, get my voice out there. Let me go to the combine coach. Maybe I take these baby steps. Turned out, I started liking this media shit. I'm like, hold on. I get to come on here. I get to come on here, talk shit. You know, I'm going to watch basketball anyway. Stack can tell you that, man. I'm, I'm glued in front of the TV 24-7. The only thing my wife would divorce me of is because I'm married to the game, 
right? So I'm gonna watch that shit. Real talk. Real talk. That's the only that's the only beef she had with a motherfucker. God damn, you got basketball on this motherfucker. You watch your basketball, what the fuck? Like, but it's all good. So what happened was, man, my first year, I worked for free. I didn't I didn't get paid for not a single show. I was doing Fox, ESPN, all those networks. The only thing that they paid for was my travel and my hotel. And I just did it, man. And all of a sudden, shit, I'm here right now. So I just try to go on there, be myself. I'm not trying to be nobody else. I'm just trying to be perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get back. We'll get. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But obviously, a tumultuous 2020. Um, what were some of the things you took from it? Obviously, you know, Kobe's passing was just over a year ago. Uh, man, the riots, the the pandemic, the president change. It's been one thing after another. What are some things you've taken from 2020 uh, to help sh uh, sh shape your focus in 2021 and moving forward? Man, well, the one thing I learned is to, to make sure that you value real relationships, you value your loved ones, and, and, and y'all know this shit. It just be certain times I just hit y'all, send y'all a text, hey, man, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about y'all. I send yeah. this to Jack all the time, and I know he be busy, because I be watching it, traveling, touching all these communities. And he'll tell you, what's the one thing I always say? Hey, big bro, I ain't want shit. I'm hitting you up to tell you, man, that I'm praying Be for safe. you. Because I know yeah. a lot of motherfuckers who stood on the front line like you doing, like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all these greats that was fighting for the things that was right. They lost their lives. So with mm -hmm. Jack being my brother, that's all I be wanting him to know is that, yeah. hey, Big perk over here, man. I'm I'm praying every single day just to make sure you safe. I get I, I and I and I appreciate that. I get thought and he ain't lying, man. I I remember, I definitely remember when I first went down to Minnesota, and uh, he had texted me once or twice and I couldn't get back to him, and then I remember he called me and I was able to answer the phone and and I had to, I had to tell him I said, bro, I've been getting your text. You know, I've been on the move, but. That's one person, along with Matt and Al and several other people, they, I can say he's one person that I always checked up on me during this whole time, man. And mm -hmm. to have support from your little brothers, you know, guys you consider your little brothers who you raised, it means a lot because they know I'm, it makes me feel like I'm doing something right. Absolutely. Definitely. Thoughts on NBA supporting social justice issues? What's your thoughts on how the NBA support them? May you know what? I actually, I actually love it, especially how a lot of these guys standing on the fucking front line, man, like, to me, the NBA is in great hands. When you look at this younger generation, guys like Kyrie, guys like Jalen Brown, Macton Brogdon, like, you know, these motherfuckers out here standing on the front line, like, these motherfuckers before they time, man, and I applaud mm -hmm. that shit, man, because it, it takes a lot for them to do it, and it shows their maturity level. Also, you see guys mm -hmm. like LeBron James, who's doing the more than the vote, Kevin Durant, who's donating money. You know, it's easy for guys like us that's retired to do whatever we do and, and try to make a difference. But to see the younger generation, the current players who don't have to do this shit, who's right now hooping, and they, they're really, man, standing on the front line, it's a beautiful thing to see. What is your thoughts on kind of the wave of coronavirus and how it's hitting teams and, you know, that there's been a lot of postponements do you think we're going to be able to get through this season at the rate we're going? Yeah, I feel like we are. Um, I feel like the way that they're going about it, sometimes you're going to have to get, have games postponed. Hell, I would, I'd rather them be postponed than canceled, right? So, right. you know, you, you we knew this coming into the season. It wasn't going to be perfect, but everybody's uh, safety is first. But I love it because if it's contact trace, then they have to, you know, postpone games if they don't have enough players but I will say this, what the NBA can do a better job at is getting more players on the roster. Like right now, mm. go go hire mm. vets, go hire some of these guys like Isaiah Thomas, you know, these guys that, that are out there swaggy P and fill up these rosters. You might have to have 20 to 22 players, but at least you can have enough that you don't have to be postponing games because you don't have enough bodies in the jerseys. That's a great point. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. How, how did, I, I know it's a challenge, you know, with the beginning of the season with all these games being missed. So tell me, tell me, um, how do you feel about that? You know, recovering with some of these guys, how they can really recover for some of these games, and what are you excited about that you've seen 
uh, the beginning of the season so far? Well, <clears throat> well, the first question is is that I feel like Adam Silver, man, to me, is the best commissioner in fucking sports, all right? When he took over, I watched the game change. For at one point, shit, motherfuckers was having to dress up in suits and all that. Man, he came and changed the game, man. He started letting players be themselves. Hell, if you want to come in here and swag up, do what you do. Well, whatever outfit you feel like doing. Matter of fact, hell, the NBA now got a damn fashion week at, at what, All-Star break or whatever the yeah. case may be. So yeah. I love that in Adam Silver. The other thing I love is that, you know what? He like this here, man. We going through a pandemic, right? The one thing, and I saw you tweet this, Jack, you and Matt, I mean, put it on the ground, was that you said, you know what? Adam Silver said, man, we ain't drug testing for marijuana. And, and rightfully so. Man, motherfuckers going through a pandemic. You having to go through all this shit. You stand in the hotel room, can't leave. Shit, a motherfucker might want to five that loud. You know what I'm saying? Let a motherfucker <laughs> five that loud. You know, whatever they smoking, whether it's the Skittles, the the OG Kush, the motherfucker. Yeah. You know, I like to fuck, I like to fuck with the perp. Let them do what they do. So I, I when I look at Adam Silver, when I look at Adam Silver, man, I'm like, you know what? This is the first time that I've ever seen uh, the Players Association and the NBA work hand in hand. Like, he's not just mm -hmm. saying, we're going to do this this way. He's listening to Michelle Roberts, Chris Paul, Paul George, and they coming mm -hmm. together. Football fans, the moment you've all been waiting for all season is right around the corner. And DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55, is bringing back their free prediction challenge. Up to $55 million in prizes are up for grabs. $55 million. And once you submit your picks, you get a free instant prize up to $25,000. If you have the most predictions correct, you can win top prize of $1 million. So make sure you download the DraftKings app now and fill out the free prediction challenge. Fill it out and answer questions like, who will score last, and get ready to make it rain. DraftKings has paid out over $7 billion to its players since 2012, so they know big paydays. Download the DraftKings app now and use the promo code SMOKE to enter the free $55 million Super Bowl challenge. That's code SMOKE, only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for more details. Hey, quick, since we're talking about that, tell me the quick story why you stopped smoking. Oh, uh, shit, Zach. So look. You know me, goddamn it, man. Shit, you know I used to be. <laughs> hey, what, what, what a motherfucker! <laughs> what a motherfucker! Loud, they're fired up. You know I want the perp, right? Long as you passing it, don't pass me no wet blunt. We cool, right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> hold on. So, so shit, the motherfucking uh. So I, I'm smoking the loud, doing what I do, right? So I'm doing the the free, the free year of me doing TV. So I go on undisputed. Now, mind I tell you, I smoked the night before, but I'm in Cali. You know, the Cali weed hit a little it's different. different. So it's I hit different. the motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> man, look, I hit the motherfucking loud, man. And man, shit, I went on undisputed with uh, Skip and Shannon. And right then, I'm, I'm still kind of blowed the next morning. And I forgot every <laughs> motherfucking thing I was going to say. And I said, I said, you know what? I said, you know what? Let me chill right now because I'm trying to start my new career. Because look, <laughs> some people go, some people can smoke loud and focus. I'm not one of them dudes, right. dog. You know, that put me <laughs> over the edge. So I said, man, you know what? Let me take let me take a break from this, man. Let me really lock in. But you know, hey, look, to every motherfucker out there who is smoking loud, smoke it. Five one for me. I'm just one that can't handle it yeah. and go on TV yeah. and talk about it the next morning because I still be blowed. You got to know yourself. That's the most important part about being a smoker. You got to know, know yourself. yourself. <laughs> yeah. You got to know yourself. Got to yeah. know yourself. Yeah, yeah hey, that's funny. Yourself. Which, 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 which young talent in the league is impressing you right now? Ooh, look, it's, I ain't going to lie. Right now, a lot of guys are putting up big numbers. But I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you something. I'm high on the bigs. You know I'm a big man, so I got a soft spot because they were saying – the big man generation was kind of washed out. So, you know, the way Joel and B and uh, uh, Big Jokic and, and even Clint Capella, the way that they're yeah. putting up numbers now, I applaud that. But you know who's my young stud because I feel like he get overlooked every single year, should have been an all-star, is Jalen Brown. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like right now, right He's now, 
He's killing. And and look, I get it. Jason Tatum is that that motherfucking Ferrari in a garage where you walk in there, it's tinted up. It got them rims on there. You know what I'm saying? Everything is it, looking good. It's that sports car. But Jalen Brown is that F three fifty. You know what I'm saying? Well, you could make yeah. that into a motherfucking hot shot truck. Put that trailer on there, and he's carrying them loads across country every goddamn day, and, and, <laughs> and getting the job speed. done. Yeah, and it's getting the job speed. done. So, so that's why I fuck with JB, man. He get overlooked. I thought he should have been an All Star last year, but he has improved. You look at his offensive package, and you watch him. It's nothing that he can't do offensively. And I'm like, nah, this that motherfucker. And then Danny Ainge. Let me tell you how bad of a motherfucker he is. Danny Ainge had an offer to actually trade for Jalen Brown. He turned that shit down for James Harden. That tells you how much value he got. Oh, yeah, that says a lot right there. Yeah, man. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Thoughts on Brooklyn? I, I, obviously, it's going to take a while for them to gel. Um, one thing I think they really need to try to address is the defensive end, but that offensive end, they're going to have, they're going to be able to pick their poison. I got some things to add on that, but I really want to hear your take on Brooklyn right now because they're one of those teams that, you know, early season were favored to come out of the East. They've hit some stumbles, but I think they're going to be just fine. No, I, no, I agree. Look, they probably have the most offensive power that we've been seeing in league history on one team. When you look at Kevin Durant, one of the best scores to touch the ball. James Harden, one of the most prolific scores. Kyrie, one of the most skilled motherfuckers to touch the ball. Offensively, they go put up 130 points. The problem is on the defensive end, man, you got to get stops. Yep. And what, I, what I'm watching is the thing that, that bothered me was I said this. Now, I, I get it. You had to give up some shit to get James back. But Jared Allen was a huge loss, in my opinion. And it's no knock on DeAndre Jordan. But I feel like he's getting to that time where he's more of a backup center. Hell, I had to go through it with Steven Adams. Steven Adams was just better than me. You know, at that time, towards the end of my career, I didn't have no problem with coming in. But he had to beat me at practice to show me that shit first. I didn't just give in. Right, he he, he right, gave me that work. Right. So, but at the end of the yeah, so so at the end of the day, I'm looking at them and it's like, yeah, man, the defense the problem, but I can't make that excuse for them. Because when you form together right. a two-time champion in Kevin Durant, a one-time champion in Kyrie Irving who didn't been to four finals or three finals, and then you put James Harden on there who has also been to the finals, and you got Jeff Green, this is not a young ball club. Like, defense is a mindset. Right. You can have your right. schemes out there, but motherfucker, you got to want to lock up. And I'm not saying that. Like, you, a motherfucker can say what they want, but when every big three – or whenever team was assembled, they locked in defensively, just like the Golden State yep. Warriors. They locked in. People could say what they wanted about Steph, but it was times that Steph actually took on the fucking challenge. Golden State was top five in every category every time they won or even went to the finals. So it's a mental, team, mental thing, and these motherfuckers not young, man. They old, so they know better. They know to go in there and, and know what it's going to take. Who is, who is teaching defense in Brooklyn? See, I heard it was Jock Vaughn. But at the end of the day, it's all about effort. Like, right. we got to see motherfuckers. You got to see motherfuckers getting, up, getting over the screen and getting to a motherfucking body. And we got to see a motherfucker on the help side willing to take a charge or rotating early. You know, prime example, when y'all was in Golden State and y'all beat Dallas, motherfuckers talk about what y'all did offensively. But y'all had motherfucking Dirk in a motherfucking straight jacket, sending multiple yeah. bodies at them, rotating on time. Y'all was committed to the motherfucking defensive end. And it, it didn't have shit to do with schemes. It was just y'all right. mentality like, motherfucker, you got me fucked up. I'm a lock up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think a perfect example of that is the Lakers. The Lakers are the number one uh, defensive efficiency team in the league, and they're not young. I was, I was talking about this earlier. They don't have that one lockup defender guy really on the wing. KCP is in, in that mold, but not. they're mm -hmm. just a smart veteran team that talks. They fly around. They cover for each other. They rotate, and they do what they have to do. They're understanding how important defense is before you can get out and run. I mean, if you're always taking the ball out the rim, it's hard to get in transition. You know what I mean? So that's the one thing. 
I will say KD plays defense. I think KD, because he's so good offensively, yep. his defense gets overshadowed. But KD locks in man to man, great help side uh, blocker. But like I said, it's just the energy and the mentality they need to come with. And I think they'll start to get that because you're not going to get, you know, having to score 130, 140 every night gets tiring. Although they have the firepower, that gets tiring. At some point, you're going to have to really start locking in and locking up. I think both L.A. teams have got off to good starts. Uh, thoughts on each of them. Start with the Clippers. And I think Paul George is playing really well right now. I think he's at the 50, 48, 90. Uh, has a lot to prove. So I think he's off to a good start. You, you know what? It's sad because the media and everybody don't give the Clippers their props because of what they did last year and that they didn't meet expectations. And that's fucked up because they're balling right now. They're clicking on yep. all cylinders. They're playing the gender-free basketball. Defensively, they're locked in. And Paul George said it on all the smoke. Motherfuckers go pay, and he's backing that shit up. A motherfucker say whatever they want about Paul George. He spoke about that shit, and he's doing that shit on the court. Kawhi is being Kawhi. But I love what the others are finally bringing to the table offensively. Pat Bell knocking down threes. I'm going to tell y'all who's an unsung hero to me. Nicholas Batum. He don't get enough credit, but he does everything that he needs to do in that offense. You see him denying the wings. You see him shooting passing lanes, taking charges. And he's knocking down those corner threes when need be. And Marcus Morris has accepted his role as coming in as a motherfucking six man. And that's what you want. So I'm looking at him. The chemistry is there. They got to get their flowers. Like, you got to leave last year and last year. Like, these motherfuckers is good. But they, but people, I feel you. And as a player, I understand that. But people, but people want to see it in the playoffs, plain and simple. No, they do. That's they do. what everyone wants to see. You know what I mean? So I, I agree with everything you say because obviously I'm a player and I know the process and how hard it is to get on the same page. You can see their chemistry is a lot better now. Ty Lue is fitting in. Ty Lue is putting in pe uh, people in position where they feel like they could be more successful. So it's happening. But at the end of the day, because I've been on those Clipper teams, you know, we, we've blown these fucking leads. We've had a lot of potential. We, we look good in the regular season, but the regular Regular season is only going to get you so far. Once they start doing it in the playoffs, I think is when the world will start because we just live in a certain yep. day and age now. We all know that. So you got to see it in the playoffs. Uh, thoughts on Lakers? Lakers are kind of, to me, I think they're kind of in cruise control right now. They, they have a great understanding. They know what they need to do. They know this is a marathon. What are your thoughts on them? Man, them, them motherfuckers is on a mission, man. But you could tell they enjoy one another. They got a camaraderie that's, that, that you could just see from the outside looking in. But right. when you look at it, yeah, man, but when you look at that yeah. shit, it starts at the head of the snake. Right now, LeBron James is ranked number one defensively in defending people. Guess who's sitting at number three? Anthony Davis. So they set mm -hmm. the tone from the jump, not on the offensive end, but on the defensive end. Like, motherfuckers, we bought in on the defensive end. Offensively, we got enough. So you see, you add a Montrez Harrell, who motherfuckers don't give enough credit to, that finished top 10 last year in rim protection, top 10 in taking charges. You add a Marcus Saul, who, who don't still have the athleticism, really. I mean, fuck, I don't know if he really had it at all, but you know what I mean. He's, <laughs> but, he, but he's still. But he's, but he's smart, still, one of the smartest he's, players he's in the game. Smart. He's super smart. smart. And, then, and then you got mm -hmm. KCP, who's not only shooting 54% from the three, but he's committed on the defensive end. And then, then you add Dennis the Menace. This motherfucker ain't backing down from nobody. He picking you up old yep. school, 94 feet. He's getting up over screens. He's being a fucking piss. But you know what? Mm -hmm. That motherfucking Taylor Harden Tucker. I don't know why he don't get motherfucking more minutes because, hey, this motherfucker done been here before, man. That shit yeah. we saw in the preseason, that ain't just a, a fluke. Like, that's something. He's really about that. Yeah, he could play. No, I love what they're doing. And when I say cruising code, not in a bad way, it looks, just looks like they figured the game out. They understand yep. what it is. They know it starts on the defensive end, and they have enough, enough offensive firepower to get the job done. So that's what I mean by that. There's kind of an old-school, new-school rift right now. Uh, just recently, you saw Shaq question Donovan Mitchell on whether he was the number one option to be able to get the team to a finals. You saw what Carl Malone said about Zion having to get in shape and play more minutes. Charles Barkley is always saying some crazy shit. And I think the players are tired of it, you know. So we were the players at one time, and we're freshly on the other side now. What do you think about what's going on between this old school, new school shit? Man, th this, this is how I feel. 
All right, you talking to a guy that was on Shaq and the Fool damn near every week. Hell, I think I got, I think I got two motherfucking MVPs in Shaq and the Fool, right? But at the end of the day, guess what? My kids still laugh at me about that shit. I don't give a fuck. Even when I was playing, right. I was not sensitive to that shit, man. You know why? Because when you sign up for the NBA, you sign up for the fortune and the motherfucking fame. Whether it's good or bad, you sign up for the fortune and the fame. And here's the thing that, that I don't like. It's like, okay, sometimes you may not agree with Charles is saying, and sometimes you may not agree with Shaq said, but at the end of the day, bro, I was making, the most I ever made was $10 million a year. I'd be damned if I gave a fuck what somebody had to say with me about me. I was still going to bed with the AC on 60 and the fan blowing in my face. <laughs> I just I just don't understand how 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 now like why are these guys so sensitive to motherfuckers talking about basketball? That's why I knew, hey look, a motherfucker knew not to bless me as a franchise player and give me a hundred and twenty million and a two hundred million dollar con shoe contract. Man, I wouldn't give a damn what a motherfucker was saying about be saying about me. Like it's basketball, man. You signed up for this shit. But on the flip side, I'm looking at it and I'm like, like addressing the Donovan Mitchell situation, right? With Shaq. People were so quick to jump on Shaq. But I, I looked at the whole interview. And Shaq started off saying, You're one of my favorite players. And when he started off saying that, I said, okay. And then he asked him, he said, I feel like you can't get it done or you can't, you're not the one to get them over the top. And I said it on purpose. To me, that was just challenging him to see what Man, was his go I said what, the same thing. What was going to be his fucking thing. response. Because y'all know it's, it's how we roll. We would have been like, Shaq, man, shit, watch. We're going to show your motherfucking ass. Watch what we do. We get back in the lab and we're going to prove a motherfucker wrong. I think he was right. just trying to challenge Donovan to the point of saying, nah, I'm going to elevate and show you. That's all Shaq was doing. And people took it all the way to the left. The man said, you're my favorite player. Now, I'm going to tell you what I don't like mm -hmm. is that, no. like, for example, with him, with Shaq, with the incident with Rudy Gobert, right? Like, He's saying how Rudy got 200, 200 million. That's, that, hey, that's like, Jack's favorite player before we get going. That's Jack's favorite player. Well, go ahead. <laughs> look, I don't like that. Absolutely because, not. <laughs> look, but he's he's not he's not mine either. But he did make, I think he made the all NBA. He did qualify for the Supermax. One thing I can't never knock is I want every motherfucking player to get as much dollars as they possibly can. Because although it's entertainment to the rest of the world, it's a job to the players. And, and the first thing is to get your motherfucking letters. So I don't. You I get don't what you negotiate. That's just how it yeah, always is. Yeah, man. So that's that's the only thing I don't be feeling when they be saying, you know, how this motherfucker got hundred million. Nah, like nah, let these motherfuckers get their bread. That's the only thing I be on. Other than that, motherfuckers need to quit being sensitive. Like how KD would be sensitive to me. On some of the things that I was saying, calling me a sellout and all that shit. I'm like, bro, we talking motherfucking basketball. And the last thing that I am is a motherfucking sellout. And part of me, part of me, the Southeast Texas 409 in me, is when I went on TV that day, it happened to be Juneteenth. I really wanted to address KD like the numbers on the house. But I had to remember <laughs> what it what it what what it was. I had to remember what it was, man. It was Juneteenth. And I and yeah. I really felt that way. Like KD, man, stop playing, man. Me and you, man, me and you in the hotel room, we big kicking it. Stack, he came down to the fold nine. Well, we in the man, back you of my. You brought, you brought you you brought him to my mama house. We in the back of Miss Julie house. Yeah, in the fold nine, man. We in the back. Yeah. Of, we in the back of the crib playing playing boo ray, man, and big kicking it, swinging wide. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't do that to me, dog. Don't, like, don't yeah. do that to me. So. Then it's like the other issue, you know, where he thought I was disrespecting him by saying that Russell Westbrook was the greatest of all time for as far as far as the greatest thunder. Now, this is what I was trying to explain to KD. Just because you're the greatest player doesn't mean that you're the best player to ever put on a thunder uniform. And a prime example, Kawhi Leonard, in my opinion, was the best player 
to put on a Raptor uniform, but he's not the greatest Raptor of all time. I would say Kyle Larry. Some people may argue Vince, but if you look at mm -hmm. their accolades, they match up and Kyle Larry might be better. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. KD, you left that door open when you chose to go to uh, Golden State. You took the praise when you won with Golden State. You got to be able to take the heat when you left OKC. They don't love you like they love Russ, and a lot of people agree to that. Russ leads that team in every statistical category. And when I said it on that day, I was actually saying it because Russ was returning back to OKC, and I said, look, roll the red carpet out for him. He's the greatest thunder of all time, in my opinion. He stood there, he embraced the moment, and he capitalized on it. I like. I, I I hear where you're coming from, but at the same time, I've also heard as a retired player some real bullshit said from people. So my whole thing is <laughs> Carl Straight Malone. Up, Carl, what Carl yeah, Malone said was some bullshit. Carl Malone, Carl yeah, Malone said some yeah, bullshit. I didn't yeah. hear the full Carl Malone interview, but the the little snippet I heard it was some bullshit to me. So I'm all for to me the back and forth now because the players have the platform too. Obviously, keep in mind, we have to understand, just like you said, we signed up for this. But still at the same time, the way I look at it is we're men first and foremost. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't take well to just straight disrespect. And I feel like sometimes some of the OG, even our OG OGs have disrespected some of the players. So if you want to get something off your chest, like Draymond and, and Chuck had to get that shit off their chest. And now they're yeah. great. Like now they say they're great friends. Like you know, from what I've heard from you know yeah, the I don't TNT know about talk. All that. You know what I mean? But I hear like they, <laughs> they they have a real they have a real bond for on the show mm -hmm. type shit. Like there's a good energy is what I meant to say. So I mean to me get that shit off your chest because I kind of think it'll always be there. Some of it is jealousy from the older players because because of what they did. These kids are getting paid so much on, so much money. I mean, to all due respect, I'm with Rudy Gobert getting two hundred or getting paid, but he shouldn't have been. The I first just would give it to him, Matt. I'm saying, but I'm saying he shouldn't have been the first big man to get two hundred men. You can't even throw him the ball at the end of the game and get a you but you know what I mean. Someone like Shaq, <laughs> right, someone right, like Elijah right. Wan, you know, someone like Embiid, Joker, you know what I mean. Like Gobert, don't get me wrong, is a great defensive anchor. I'm not taking nothing. Get your money, but I understand where Shaq was coming from because Shaq would have. Killed Gobert every oh day, uh, oh, yeah. night and day. Oh, yeah. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, so I, so, so some of that shit is like, man, this nigga's weak type shit. But at the same time, the <laughs> game is changing, and because of what these dudes have done, these younger players are eating off us. Of. So I see that there's some frustration from some of the older dudes because of how hard they worked, and these guys reaping the benefit. But that's what you really want at the end of the day. You want to make it better than when you, you know, leave it better than when you was there. So, like I said, I get that back and forth, but to me, just get the shit off your chest. You got something to say? Say it. If, if, if a commentator comes at you crazy, I have no problem with the player firing back. And I don't like when people say, like I said, some players are sensitive, but I feel some players. Like, I don't like people to say, like, well, you got all this money, you shouldn't fire. Like, nah, like I said, first and foremost, I'm a man. You know what I mean? So, if you're going to disrespect me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend my honor. And I've, I've always been that way mm -hmm. with coaches, commentators, whoever. Like, if you, I'll take the criticism. I'll take the heat. But if you disrespect me, I feel like I have, we have a real problem. No, but, no, and, no, and look, Matt, hey, let, me, let me say this, Perk. I think, too, like a lot of people, just like you said, the younger, play, younger, younger players are reaping the benefits of the older players and, and some of the stuff we've done. Well, what we're doing now on TV, we're reaping the benefits of some of the stuff that was laid for us. By previous Absolutely. players that first started on TV. Look what we done took mm -hmm, it to. Mm -hmm. So you got to evolve. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We, we all evolve and we all growing, man. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. like you said, Matt, one, one thing about our show that separates us, we're able to have our guests on here disagree, but respect stays. Right. The respect right. remains there at all yep. times. And I think, and I, and I, and I think the, the, older, the older guys, especially guys older than us, it's a way to relate things without sounding like hating. But nine out of ten times, the way they're coming across, it just sound like hating to me. Mm. No, 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 no. I could, I could second that. And it sound, it sound like a, uh, it sound bitter. I'm just saying, I'm not agreeing with a lot of shit that they're saying. All I'm saying is, me personally, mm -hmm. I just like certain shit that that they talk about, like that I was talked about for us basketball wise. I ain't give two fucks. But if a motherfucker came at me on some like personal shit attacking, then yeah, I gotta talk. I gotta. You know, take up for myself, but I'm talking about basketball wise. It's kind of like, all right, man, whatever. Put me on Shaq and the fool every motherfucking week, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. If that make yep. you happy, I'm gonna yep. keep it moving. But I, but now, <laughs> right. but y'all got, but y'all got a real point though. That's a real point though, and it shouldn't come off as hate. Basketball right. talk shouldn't come off as hate or attacking somebody personal. So I'm with you on that. 
Well, let's jump back to where it started. Uh, Texas, you know, you and Jack were, you know, had a good upbringing, or excuse me, a, you guys were in the same areas. You guys met at a, uh, 14. Same high school coach, same high school coach too, Matt. Tell me about you and Jack's bond and when that started. Shit, man, Jack, Ben had a bond. Jack embraced me. I remember when Jack was hooping overseas, we had the same high school coach. And uh, man, Boo, his name Coach Andre Butte, we called him Boo. And Boo used to always say, Stevie, Stevie, Stevie. And I just couldn't wait to meet Jack. So this was my freshman year. Jack came home, man, and he actually came into our gym and hooped with us in our high school practice. And right there, shit, we and him start hitting the weights. You remember that no, shit, Jack? Tell, 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 tell the truth, Perk. Tell the truth. You, you was punishing me. I, I, I came home, and I didn't know he was that damn big, uh, uh, Matt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I didn't know he was that Boo, Boo, Boo told me he had an animal down there. He told me that animal when I got there, Matt, I ain't know he was seven foot, two, 280, bringing the ball up the court, crossing over. I wasn't ready for that, Matt. I was shit. I was, I was still trying to figure it out my damn self. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hey, look, Steve came in. I ain't no bullshit. Six, eight, motherfucker, sham guard and hitting motherfucker. I'm like, damn, boo. You told me motherfucker was playing like the four, five when you had him. You ain't telling this motherfucker had all this, but we. We in that motherfucker practicing. Motherfuckers, like, it lit up. It was a joy. And Steve don't even know that one practice set the tone for us to go on and go 36-0 and and win the championship yeah, to keep it all the way I real because that. motherfuckers was trying to stick Steve on a perimeter. He was getting his work off, but motherfuckers was like, hold on, man. If I could kind of play against Steven Jackson, he getting off. Right. I ain't afraid of yep. no motherfucker. So that's when mm -hmm. we was on. And then it went on mm -hmm. to... Man, I watched Steve Journey, man, from when he went to the Brooklyn Nets to the San Antonio Spurs. Man, I remember walking in the mall. Jack saw me. Me and two of my uh, teammates, Albert Marshall and Brandon Chappelle, took us in Brandon. Foot Locker, man, blessed us with all type of J's and shit. And in high school, shit, that was like, that was everything to us. So it was like that <laughs> bond, that bond was everything, man. And I started, you know, everything was just Steve Jackson for me, like, Shit, I'm watching Steve. I watched him when he went to Brooklyn. Shine Nell, I think, what, Steve? Made the all-rookie team. San Antonio, Steve mm -hmm. had us come down. Me and Boo went down there, watched him play in the uh, finals. Went to L.A., watched him play in the yep. finals against the Lakers. Like, that whole thing. Yep. So I was like, man, I watched the grind. I watched the step Steve went through. Went to ABCD camp. Went, worked out, grinded there after motherfuckers finished playing. And shit, man. Here we are today. I remember my first year in the league. Steve had something to do. Went down to his camp in PA. Mama Julie was there. She was like, baby, Steve going to be running late. No, don't worry about it. I got it right now. Steve Run be in camp. Thursday. I got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Mama Julie come up to me like, how much I owe you? I said, what? Shit, you don't owe me a damn thing. And I ain't take a dollar. Matter of fact, I came no. up. Steve came up. I dropped him a check for 10 k to his foundation. Yeah. Let me tell you how yep. the shit reversed. So Steve come to my camp. I have a little episode. Motherfucker, I got to, you know, get into it. Me and Steve about to go to jail. Me and Steve about to go to jail <laughs> outside the club. No bullshit. Ask Steve. We about to have a whole motherfucking ride started because the motherfucker was in the wrong, did some shit to us, and we riding. Yep. Motherfuckers hitting us with motherfucking them. Uh, 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 Billy clubs and shit. Billy clubs and shit. And, man, Steve rolled for me, man, and, and, and like, was there, held my camp down the next two days, the banquet, I couldn't make it there. And that's how we've been rocking, man. Matt, we've been rocking for a while like that, like mm. just every time. So when I was at the, when I was playing, if we weren't playing the same night Steve was playing, shit, my motherfucking TV was watching Steve Jack. That's how a motherfucker mm. was. Summertime, hey, my, we go, we link back up, we go back home, and shit, we together. We go hoop. Yeah. We gonna blow that good loud and shit. We yep. posted up chilling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 Matt, my 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 story is similar, man. I remember, I remember Coach Butte. Shout out to Coach Butte. I uh, won a state championship with Butte in '95, and uh, he had Butte to always to tell me, man, Jack, by far the best player I've played, I've coached. You know what I mean? And I remember him calling. He was like, man, I remember telling people. I remember saying in the media, you was the best player I coached. But I don't know, Jack. I got I got something that you and me never seen in our area before. I'm like, what you got, Coach? To say, Jack, I got a real one. I got a real big man that can do it all. 
So, you know what I'm saying? I Before I met him, Matt, I knew I was going to support him because of the relationship that me and Butte right. had. You know what I'm right. saying? Um, short story about Butte. I, I wanted to stay in, at Lincoln and play in my senior year, but Butte knew that I had a, a career in basketball. So he sent me to Oak Hill, Matt. I didn't want to go to Oak Hill. My mom and Coach Butte pulled me aside and my uncle and forced me to go to Oak Hill. It was the best decision I could have made, but that's 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 to tell you about the Coach Butte. Mm -hmm. But um, but he he was just silent, man. And when he told me to, when he told me about Perk, I couldn't wait to get home to see exactly what Butte was saying because Butte brought the best out of so many players from my city. And uh, when I was able to see Perk and after I got a chance to play against him and seeing his size, and I knew for a fact, Matt, it was no college. It was no more – after his senior year of high school, it was no – It was no, he was going straight to the league, man. And I was just happy to be a part of it because during that time, you know, a lot of people don't know Perk lost his mother at a young age and they don't know the, the, the things he went through growing up, you know what I'm saying, how strong his grandparents was. These are the things that I, that I grew to know, you mm -hmm. know, um, at, 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 from being around him and, and help raising him. And then growing, come to the point where I'm in his wedding, seeing him marry somebody – uh, from my hometown, who her family, my family, a like family, you know, it 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 just, it just all yeah. it just all came full circle, man. Then to see him win the championship, Matt, and it got to the point where one day I got real emotional because me and him was up was was courtside working on finals together in Golden State, and That's and cool. I looked at it and I t and I took a pitch. I'm like, this is crazy, bro. Two young young fellas from Port Arthur, Texas, look at us both now by the same high school coach. We made it to where we both NBA champions and we standing on ESPN together doing stuff at the basketball that nobody thought we would do. That yeah, meant the yeah. world to me, man. I, I'm, I'm just proud yeah. of you, bro, because we, yeah. we, 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 stayed, we stayed knocking doors down and doing things that people say we couldn't do from my area, and uh, you motivate me to keep going, bro. Let me, let me tell you, let me, let me add something to that, Matt. It's crazy because my wife was like, Hold on, you going on all the smoke? Hell yeah. She was like, shit. Hell yeah, this is what I've been waiting on, right? But because You know, people, ba you know Van are real with me. Yeah, 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 man. People don't want Matt, people don't understand. Like, literally, like Steve, Steve, well, Steve Mama House, Miss Julia's, and my mother in law house is literally a mile away from each other. So yeah. like, but the upbringing from my brother in laws to to Donnie. You know what I'm saying? Donnie is my motherfucking brother for sure. Like that's my that's mm -hmm. my boy. But let me tell y'all, let me tell y'all what Steve say is crazy because we got a lot of fans and we got a lot of people that support us from our area. But man, we got some motherfucking haters. And I'ma tell you how. Let me tell you. <laughs> and it, it's 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 real shit. Cause I'ma tell you this. So, like it, it just tell you how motherfuckers be trying to come between people. It's like, so when y'all started all the smoke. Last year, I'm like, hell yeah, y'all getting it, getting it going. Great guests on that motherfucker. Motherfuckers like, man, why Stack ain't got you on yet? I'm like, motherfucker, relax, man, relax, <laughs> motherfucker. Let the motherfuckers, <laughs> let the motherfuckers get the shit going first, man. But it just show you, it just show you right. how motherfuckers are and how they try to come between motherfuckers. But they weren't coming between me and Jack. I don't give a fuck what nobody was saying at because all. at the end of the day, guess what? If I would have, if I would have been on, if I would have came on all the smoke three years from now, I would have been as happy as the, the from right now. So at the end <laughs> of the day, you can't tell me because I haven't been on there yet what my love is for my brother. Nah, motherfucker, you could miss me with that shit. Right. Matter of fact, the same motherfucker yeah. who's saying it, I'm gonna block you right now and move along because. I ain't with that bullshit, but that's how much a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Nah, real talk, because that's how I much motherfuckers are trying yeah, to. Yeah, you don't need that kind of energy. You apart. Yeah, but they're yeah, trying to pull you energy. apart, dog. But they, but 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 they, 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 you know, from our city, man, they tried for years to pit us against each other. You know what I'm saying? But we always supported each other. They always tried to pit us. At per well, Perk did Steve doing that? Perk, but they, but we never let that happen. You know what I'm saying? We always kept yeah. a united front, man. So all that shit was yeah. not for nothing. That's big. That's big. Um, so like Jack said, he, he knew there was no college for you. When did you know you had a real uh, chance to jump to the league? Because I don't think a lot of people realize that you, w w was your last year or the year after you was the last year they could jump? Uh, it was two years after me. So okay. I, went to, I, I went to ABCD camp. I was, on, I was playing for the Houston Hoops, which was a Nike team. You know, Jack played for it. I followed his Josh Pastner. Yep, the, yeah, the same motherfucking advice our high school his, uh, coach Butte gave him. He gave me the same damn advice. I'm gonna make. Yeah. I'm gonna do what's best for you. So he like you going to this Adidas camp. So I went in that motherfucker Matt, 
And I told, Steve was there. And I told that bitch up. Like, I told that motherfucker up. I left out of there the number one ranked player of the whole camp. Now, that's with LeBron James. This yep. is my sophomore year. Lenny Cook. All these, yep. the White yeah, Howard. Sebastian Telfair. Yeah. I left out of there on paper the number one player leaving out of that camp. And from I flew then, in for that, Matt. Yeah. I flew in for that, yeah. And from then, from then, we didn't, we didn't know, we didn't, uh, we didn't have social media, so motherfucker was going to the motherfucking Dell on the computer to look up rankings, <laughs> to look up, uh, to yeah. look up the mock draft and all that shit. So as a sophomore, I started seeing my name being involved with the mock draft. I'm like, hold on, I got a chance to get drafted. They had me going like second round. So my junior year, I come out. We playing, we playing Central, Beaumont Central rivalry game, mm-hmm. in city game. I come Ooh. out. I come out, it's Sam Presti from the Spurs, B.J. Armstrong from the Bulls, and a, uh, I forgot his name, but he was a scout for, for the Washington Wizards, sitting courtside at a table when I go out for warm-ups. And I'm like, man, what the fuck? You know how Boo do. He don't even tell you about it. So I go out there, and I'm like, hold on, man. It's real NBA scouts down here in Beaumont, Texas. I put up 41 in that motherfucker, right? So I'm like, <laughs> no, nah, real talk. I'm snatching the screws out of everything. I'm dunking the fuck out that bitch, yelling. I'm doing it all. Fuck all that shit. So, man, right then, right then I start seeing, man, certain shit, certain shit start coming along where it's like, you know, every year I was moving up. They was like, Perk could go for, uh, first round. My senior year, they was like, Perk could be a late first round, early second round. And then... You know, I met Sonny Vaccaro, who who was huge Mafia. in the Adidas market. You got damn right. And uh, he started putting me in position, man. And I worked out for three, t- four teams. Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Boston. And I got four guarantees. Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio had the last three picks of the first round. And Boston had the 20th pick with the second round. I mean, first round. I went to Boston. I killed Brian Cook. In a workout, who was the national player of the year that year? I, I killed him. Like went to work on that motherfucker. Danny was like, "Hold on, we need you to stay another day." And so stayed another day. He told Butte now that I was getting drafted. That they was gonna take me with the twentieth pick. The motherfuckers never said a word to me. This was in May. Whole time I'm nervous as hell, man. They just telling me you got to keep working. We got to wait for some more <laughs> phone calls. The whole time they knew I'm getting drafted. So, man, the draft night come, motherfuckers still don't tell me nothing. They sitting there calm. I'm in this motherfucker like, man, I ain't got no motherfucking guarantee. But they come in with some Celtic gear on. So I'm like, hold mm. on. So as the pick's going, it's uh, what ended up happening, they trade the motherfucking picks to the Memphis picks because the Memphis wanted, I mean, uh, Boston wanted to make sure they grabbed Marcus Banks. And they end up picking me with the 27 pick, man. And that's how I end up getting drafted. But I'm telling you. Motherfucker Butte had me skipping senior skip day. Only thing he let me go to was prom, man. Motherfucker had me going there at, at five in the morning, running the yeah. track, making sure my weight was yeah, down. That's right. You know, because my mama died when I was five. She was shot and killed by her best friend, you know. So my mama died when I was five. My daddy bounced and went overseas. So I was raised by my grandfather and my grandmother. My grandfather was making $300 a month. My grandmother was making $40 a week being a maid. My grandfather cleaned up the church. My motivation was was that I got to get them out this situation. Right. So the first thing I did when I got my check, I bought them a motherfucking crib before I bought myself a house. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's what's sure up. Sure did. Sure did. So you're a Boston Celtic at 17 years old, one of the most historical franchises in the history of the game. What's going through your mind now? You made, you're there. Haven't made it, mm. but you're there. I'm there. I don't know what's going through my mind. Like at that time, I'm just happy I made it to the league. So I'm so I'm so country, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Stack will tell you, it's motherfucking, you know, we go to the moms and pop shops where we from. It's it's shrimp fried rice, fried shrimp, you hitting up Bruce's, you hitting up Vince's, you hitting John yeah. Seafood. That's what I'm accustomed to. I get to Boston, I don't see none of that shit. It's pizza and fucking clam, <laughs> clam chowder and all this shit. I'm so country, I don't even know nothing about shipping cars. Man, me and George yeah. Davis, me and G hop in, hop in my truck to Denali. 
We drive 31 hours. Pack the motherfucker mm. up. We drive 31 My hours classmate. to Boston. Yep, I got the yeah. fuck up out of there, man. I ain't give a fuck what was going on. I left early. We was supposed to report Labor Day weekend. Motherfucker, I was there at the middle of August. <laughs> 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 Ready to get it in. Hey, who were some of who were some of your vets on 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 your on your rookie team? Man, you know what? It's crazy because I always say if you if you come into the league and you have great vets, you will long nine times out of ten you will have a long career because they go mm-hmm. show you they go mm-hmm. show you the ins and outs and 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 it, it see like you know the average career is four years, but when you Get past 10 years, it's a blessing. That means you're doing something right. So motherfuckers was, it ain't what you do, it's how you do it. Man, I had some great vets in that motherfucker, man. Walter McCarty, Tony Batie, Tony Delk, Eric Williams. Like, I had some of them old soul motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying, who who, who really embraced me like, hey, young fella, this is how you need to do shit. This is how you need to carry yourself. Look, it's all right to step out on the town, but this is how you got to conduct it. Do it at this time. They watching you, young fella. Get your ass be the first one in there. Be the last one to leave. I don't care if you ain't working or not. Be sitting in this motherfucker till everybody leave this bitch. Like, just teaching me the ropes. What was it like building relationships with Doc Rivers and Paul Pierce? You know what, man? You know, Paul, man, Jack, he took me under his wing, man, when I got to Boston. I ain't going to lie. Paul, Paul, he saw that. Let me tell you what Paul did. So you know Paul is like Paul is like that guy like us. He want to see where your heart at. He want to see if right. you got some, if you a real one. So my first preseason game ever, I go against Detroit Pistons. They got big Ben Wallace. You know, they got some up big DC down there. That's my first preseason game. Well, I played like 10 minutes. I had eight and eight in that motherfucker. I'm in that bitch dunking, going that big Ben, shooting my little broke ass jump hook and shit. So Paul was like, hold on, young fella, young fella, young fella got some dog in him. You know what I'm saying? And Paul put me through a test one time. He was like, yeah, I see you in here. You in, a, you in here getting early. Let me see where your heart at. He dropped $1,500 on the float. Now, $1,500 to me at the time, shit, that's a yeah. lot of motherfucking money. So he, yeah. it's, it's six, seven inches of snow out there in the, in, in the bean time. Paul, like, I bet you won't go outside and give me 100 push-ups in your tights in the snow. I said, shit, you got me fucked up. I'm going out there and knock these motherfuckers out. Went out there and knocked out them 100 in the snow, in the snow with tights on. Came back and got my motherfucking bread. And Paul was like, oh, nah, this motherfucker like that. You, hey, we keeping you. And then Doc, Doc came in, man. And Doc really, in my opinion... He changed my career because he made me be okay with who I was as a player, right? So the first year, we we went through a bad – no, we made the playoffs with Antoine and Gary Payton and, and, and motherfucking Paul, and, and, and we made Ricky, Ricky Davis, and we, we made a run. We lost to y'all, Jack. Yeah. We lost to yeah. y'all, the Pacers, the yep. Pacers. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so <clears throat> Doc, the next year we lost 18 in a row, Matt. Doc called me in his office. They made a trade, traded my boy Big Al Jefferson. Jack, you know how close I was with Big Al. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he like, nah, Perk, this go change everything. I know you hurt, but motherfucker, we got KG. We about to win the title. Mm. Doc called me in his office and was like, look, 24, be a role player. Your job is to anchor the defense, rebound, block shots, set good screens, finish around the basket. That's it. And Perk, if you listen to me, you gonna have a long career and you're gonna make you some good money. And don't mm-hmm. fuck with the outsiders say they know what you bring. Your teammates and your coaches know what you bring into the table. And when Doc instilled that into me, I was cool because I was all right with who I was. I was taking pride in setting great screens. I was taking mm-hmm. pride of calling out ice, not letting a motherfucking guard come down here or turn the uh, corner on the pick and roll. So it was all good, so that's how Doc changed everything for me. One thing Doc used to say is be a star in your role. You yeah. know what I mean? Be a star. People don't have to understand, obviously, with all the accolades you had uh, offensively, which you could have did, you bought into your role. Same thing you, you Jack. Jack's 
is a bucket. But at the beginning of his career, he had to do other things, to, you know, till he got to that point. And I think nice. that's where a lot of young people fall off is everyone wants to come in and score like KD or Steph or James. And them, those, you know, them motherfuckers are special. Most of the time you're yeah. coming yeah. in to be a role, to be a role, to fill a role, not to be the, to fill a role. And I think that's where a lot of people, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't get it. <clears throat> um, what was it like going into that 2007 summer? I mean, you guys have had four but, years there, a little bit of up and down, but going into that summer, knowing that w what you guys were about to do, what was it like? What was the atmosphere and vibe like? Man, it was, I ain't going to even lie. I was down there in PA at, at my mother-in-law house, and I and I saw the trade with KG. First, I saw the trade with Ray. What the fuck we doing? Then we get KG, and it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, Boston is a favorite to win the title. At that point in time, man, I'm like, Shit, I'm about 23 years old. A championship ain't on my mind. Fuck, I'm trying to I'm trying to make an all-star game here or there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm coming yeah, up. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm trying to make an all-star game. I'm thinking of myself individually until, you know what I'm saying, they got it together, man, and Doc had that conversation like, Perk, we could have traded you, but we value what you bring to the table. And he was like, you need to be ready. You and KG alongside of each other defensively. It's going to be a problem. And once I start hearing everybody constantly talk about this shit, talk about it, saying, man, y'all going to be a problem. Dog, do you know what you do? You know what you about to be a part of? And I didn't realize it at first. And then I realized it as I kept hearing about it and when I got to training camp. What was it like, obviously, picking up Ray, picking up KG, but what was it like working with someone like KG? Because we've heard so many crazy, amazing, energetic stories about that dude. You got him as a young fella. What was that like? Man, that was the best shit that ever happened. That's the most unselfish motherfucker I ever played with in my life. The best teammate ever. KG got there, and he t he instantly took a back seat to Paul and Ray and made himself the third option. And that right there, like, that set the tone from the jump. Man, KG used to just do shit like, you know, all the interns around that motherfucker. He used to buy them five custom-made suits. We won that motherfucker. He bought everybody except the players, Rolex watches. He used to cater Rue Chris and all that shit. He he set himself as a third option to Paul and Ray. He came to me and was like, you know what? Me and you, we going to focus on this defensive end. We're going to set screens, get these motherfuckers open, dive hard. Look, if I don't get you 8 to 10 points a game, I ain't doing my part. Motherfucker, just have your hands ready. And he used to just <laughs> hold me accountable. Like, getting right. in the weight room. Yeah, man, getting in the weight room. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and KG had that motherfucking intensity, man, that he used to bring to the table. It's like, pregame, it's like, shit. Motherfucker, you got to be locked in fucking around with him because he locked in at shoot-around. Like, it's just tunnel vision. And he's all in about the team. And, and I think that's what made it a success more than anything was just how he sacrificed. But for us... Y'all had him on on the show. Fuck y'all know y'all can feel a y'all can feel a motherfucking vibe when you meet a real motherfucker and know it's authentic. Who is KG on that motherfucker on all the smoke? That's who he is in real life. People see that that ah oh, and fierce competitor, but off the court, man, motherfucker cooler than a fan, man. A real motherfucker who will get the shirt off his back and got a heart of gold, man. Everything comes together. You start hearing you guys are favored to win the championship. What was that following season like? Man, it, it was great. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We was always together. I think going to Rome for training camp really set the tone because we we were damn near forced to fuck with each other and get to know one another. Because me and KG had beef. Like, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just, you know, peaches and cream. I didn't like that motherfucker. He didn't like me either when he was in Minnesota. So, motherfucker didn't know how we was going to interact, man. And we had that first, I mean, we took that seven hour flight to Rome. He didn't say shit to me and I ain't say nothing to him. I'm like, <laughs> fuck it then, nigga, it is what it is, right? So shit, we get out there, we have our first camp. Man, this motherfucker just tied on the string together. He like, hold on, man, this motherfucker know he got his IQ right. This motherfucker going to war with me. I'm, I'm covering from, he covering for me. It was just like instant. Ever since then, it was on. So we get to Rome, we get to Rome, man, and we forced to fuck with each other. We out there for three weeks. So everywhere, it was it was all of us at one time. We going everywhere together. 
we eat down in the lobby, kicking it together. And then it just carried on. So we just went through preseason like it was the prep for our season, and we hit the ground running. And when I knew we had something special, it's Gilbert Arenas, Chill Gil was talking shit. I remember he was like, man, y'all motherfuckers crowning them. They ain't done shit yet. You remember the Wizards was a force in the Eastern Conference. Mm -hmm. So what ended mm -hmm. up happening was, tell you how Doc did the game, he put the whole article on the front door of, of the locker room of the arena. So when you walked in that motherfucker, you had to see it. And we all read mm -hmm. that motherfucker. And he made sure pregame he was like, you hear what these motherfuckers said? We came out and smacked the motherfuckers by 50. That's when I knew. I was like, oh, shit. We on a mo. Yeah, we, 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 we on one. Mm, but the season, was, the season was cool, man. We kicked it. We went out. We gambled. Shit, we, we, I mean, on the plane, the motherfucker was like the hood. I'm talking about, man, shirt off, big ass boom box on the front, motherfucker shooting dice, motherfucker arm wrestling for money, man. It was going down on, <laughs> it was the hood. But Doc let us be us, you know what I'm saying? Right. So we in that motherfucker kicking it. We got motherfuckers like T.A., old shy, 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 shy time motherfucker on the dice, gambling, slick rolling <laughs> and shit like that. So, man, it was all good, man. So you get through that season. Um, you guys faced the Lakers in the finals. What is the thought of, of that so early, first year into it? You, you're in the rivalry. You're in the Lakers-Celtics rivalry now. Man, that shit crazy. Y'all know from going to the finals. If you ain't careful, you could just get caught up in the whole finals itself. You know, the media, right. the introduction, all that shit. You got to remember that you there to play motherfucking basketball. Then on top of that, we going against a bad motherfucker on the other side. So we had to make sure we were locked in. So, you know, getting there, that whole Celtic Lake and rivalry, you watching that shit on television, you like, damn. Get to the Staples Center or the Garden, both of them fired up. They running all the traditional things, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Kareem, you know, uh, 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 hell, shit. I, you, all the motherfuckers. You know them ancient motherfuckers that was on them Mikhail, motherfuckers. Mikhail, all them motherfuckers. Yeah, 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 yeah man. So, so we get to we get to the to the game, and once it was jump ball, it was like shit. We go trap the shit out of Kobe, and everybody else got to beat us, and that's what that's the way we made it. They was like perp. You got Casal head up, body that motherfucker. KG, you got Lamar Odom. This how we go play him. We go force him to take jumpers and shit. We go trap Kobe on pick and rolls so he get the ball out of his motherfucking hands. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Game six, close out at home. What did that mean to you guys to be able to do it on your floor? Man, it meant everything because the last thing we wanted to do was go back to L.A. And, mm -hmm. and we knew – because of the identity that we established in the garden, that once we got a motherfucker back home, it was going to be a problem because that motherfucker got the rocking. And you know how hostile they get in, in, in those Boston arenas. Motherfuckers will tell you everything under the sun. So with that being said, man, when we got back home, it was it was on our mind to finish that shit, man. And, and it meant everything, just the atmosphere. We got it done. Motherfuckers was tied on the string. Everybody got playing time. We was deep. It was just a good-ass feeling, man. Then to beat the Lakers at that, it was everything. Uh, Kobe said that was his, the toughest loss of his career, um, falling to you guys in the 08, uh, 08 finals. Um, you know, that had to be a part. I mean, that had to be a special run. It's your first taste. How old are you at this point, 23, 24? Yeah, 23. Baby, 23, man. Baby face. Championship. Baby. Popping yeah. pop bottles. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shit was crazy, <laughs> man. But look, but look, I, I, I tell you what, I could tell that Kobe was pissed like a motherfucker. And I was saying to myself, I said, man, look, next year if we make it back, this motherfucker gonna have it on his mind. But we didn't make mm. it back. But you saw what he did to Orlando, but shit. Oh, it, was, it was just it but but you know the thing about Kobe was was that even when we went up 20, at one point of the, 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 the game six, I was still scared than a motherfucker because I'm like, man, this ain't this league ain't know. safe. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, like this motherfucker started hitting fadeaways over double teams and shit out of the corner three. I'm like, man, shit, here we go with this shit again. Yeah, no, he was that. He said that, that was the one for him. 2009, y'all trying to defend the title. KG get hurt. How hard was that? How, how how hard was the team, and how frustrated was the team when KG went down? 
man, we, we was fucked up because we knew we had a small window, especially with the age of KG and Ray. Not necessarily Paul, but we had a small window to win as many championships as we possibly can. And I thought, you know, we competed. We went to that seven-game series with the Chicago Bulls and, and uh, you know, seven games with the Orlando Magic. But uh, I thought we should have beat the Magic that year, in my opinion. But, hey, you know, we didn't do it. But, you know, I thought it was good for me, though, Stack and Matt, because that was one of the best – that was some of the best basketball that I actually played individually. During those 14 games, shit, I averaged like 17, 12, and three blocks. So it was all good for me individually because I got to find myself again. Right. And I was like, you know what? Going into next season, shit, I'm going to be all right. And it was crazy because it opened up eyes to Doc Rivers because the next season, he actually started saying, here, we running some turn five support. And KG, go. KG, Paul, and Ray actually said, you know what? In the regular season, what we going to do is, shit, we going to develop these motherfuckers. Rondo, you got the keys, perk here. I'm about to give you some little offensive package. Motherfucker, you ain't going to be mm -hmm. doing all that shimmy shaking. You going to have a right hook, left hook, <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I find you. You dunk that motherfucker. Now I'm going to be mm -hmm. courtesy and let you get some of my rebounds because y'all know how KG was. About his uh, boys and everything, one, his. everything. You got, but everything. They, was, they, they was running the first play of the game for you. Every yep. game they was running the first play of the game yep. for you. Yep, every time, man. And, and KG, KG, Jack, and, and Matt, he was like, you know what? I used to go grab a rebound. He was, he used to be like, thank me, lady, you bitch ass nigga. Like he used to be on it. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So man, shit, man. He, he started letting us come in our own, and they start, they start motherfucking let Rondo. Have the keys mm. to the car, which yep. which I'ma say this real quick, which wasn't it was a good thing because Rondo was ready, but this is when him and Ray started having they little, you know what I'm saying, they little beef because you know Ray really wasn't bought in to just handing Rondo over the keys. Paul and KG was like, nah, let this motherfucker go. He getting us easy shots. But Ray kind of still wanted to bring the ball up, and that's when the beef started happening. And that's when we had to pull out the motherfucking gloves in the weight room and let Ray and Rondo put the motherfuckers on and go at it for a minute. Like, they actually got on the gloves. We like, nah, y'all got animosity, y'all go box this shit yeah, out, and yeah. they got on. That's that old school shit. I ain't never heard that story. Yeah. Who won, you think? Who you think Man, won? Rondo. Man, Rondo was got on Ray ass, man, like a man. Man, I, I, I knew that. I, I had that feeling. I had that feeling. And, 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 and I know why. And I know why Ray was mad when Doc gave him the keys. Because, like I said this before, Matt, before we even have a perk on here, the big three was Rondo, Paul, and KG. Ray wasn't part of the big three in my mind anyway. And I say that because I ain't hating, but to everybody out here, I say that because I used to punish Ray. You know what I'm saying? He did. Yeah, he did. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say that because I used to punish him. I, so he I, wasn't Matt, as good to me as he was to y'all. You feel what I'm saying? Matt, Matt, I can't lie. Look, Steve was in Charlotte, and, man, they, they got into it heavy, him and Ray, right? So yep. when we they got stoppage on the court, motherfuckers about to fight, and motherfucker next day they're like, damn, Perk, why you didn't run up in the mix? I'm like, shit, I was breaking it up, but y'all got to understand, man, stack my motherfucking family. I can't like I ain't getting. I, look, I went broke the shit up, but I ain't getting. Yeah. Nah, hell nah, that's family yeah, right there. Y'all yeah. could miss yeah. me with that one. Shout out Ray Allen. Shout out Ray Allen, though, man. Shout out Ray Allen. Yeah, shout love. out Ray Allen. Yeah. So 2010, like you said, Rondo's raising his level to an All Star performance. That's when we we beat we we lost you guys in the Eastern Conference Finals. You guys go on to face the Lakers again. Um. Tell us about that battle, because that was a little bit different. You guys suffered some key injuries during that run in the finals, and the Lakers end up uh, beating you guys on some big shots at the end. I'm glad y'all well, beat Matt and them, because they swept the shit out of us. <laughs> we should have, yo. Bro, we had beat them 3-1 during the regular season, and Stan got scared going in the Eastern Conference Finals. We thought we were going to make a couple adjustments. This dude changed the whole offense, so they beat the shit out of us game one, mm -hmm. game two, game three. We win game four. And I think lose game five or lose – do we lose – No, y'all won we game five. five. We won, get, we won yeah, six. Yeah, we won two in a row. Once we kind of said, like, man, fuck this, let's yep. get back to our shit. And then they beat us in game six. 
That shit was crazy. Two. I, I, I thought we should have went to the finals that year and, and played the Lakers, but you know what I mean? Some, some crazy shit went into that Eastern finals. They ended up beating us. And, and it's crazy because I, I'm glad you brought up that point, man. And I, I tweeted this the other day, and there's no hate, but, you know, motherfucker got to keep it real. And this is why I said, I tweeted this. I said, y'all really thought that Stan Van Gundy was the coach, was, was the right coach for the New Orleans Pelicans. No, nah, he, he wasn't the right coach. Like, I felt like you should have hired a young stud, but that's a whole yeah. other conversation. That's a I whole like, other conversation. I, uh, I'm with I you like on that part. Hey, I like, like Stan and his man. X and O's. He's old school, though, real. I like his X and O's, but, you know, Shaq said that shit a long time ago when it comes to pressure, and we completely, bro, we were 8-0 in the playoffs, beating teams by more than 25 points a game, and we changed our whole mm. strategy to play against a team we had beat three out of four games that season. Shit was man, crazy. Just, if it ain't broke, it, it, don't fix it. Yeah, man, but it's just crazy because I felt like it was so many young studs out there like, even Damon Stoudemire, man, who's coaching at, at, at a collegiate level right now. Uh, uh, Sam Cassell. Like, man, bring some young blood up in there, man, because it's a new day and age, right? Like, it's a new it's a new era. Motherfuckers ain't buying into all that hoorah and defensive and exit. Yeah, you got to play defense, but you got to let motherfuckers rock out on the offensive end. All that yeah. player movement and running sets, motherfuckers ain't doing that. High pick and roll or ISO, let these motherfuckers go to work. But that's another story. 2010, 2010, man, I remember that shit more than the year that we won it because it was like our starting five healthy. We never lost a, we never lost a, a, a playoff series. And I felt like going into L.A., we was up, we was up 3-2, three, three, game six in L.A., Felt like we had the right momentum going. Obviously, they get Andrew Bonham back, so now I'm playing Andrew Bonham ticket playing. Uh, uh, Mark, I mean, uh, Paul Casal, wow. yeah, Paul Casal. So the motherfucking matchups is even. We down there, we battling like a motherfucker. We going at it. So man, I tell my motherfucking ACL man, and it was the worst thing of my life because I didn't think it wasn't that I didn't feel like I wasn't gonna bounce back. But you just never take going to the finals mm, for granted. Talk to him. Because people, people don't understand. It's hard to just get to the finals, let alone win the championship. And I'm like, Thanks. man, I might not reach this shit again ever in my life. That's why it hurted me. And then having to sit out game seven and watch us have a 14-point lead in the fourth quarter and the Lakers walk that shit down to win the championship and watch them celebrate on, on, our home, on their home court and us having to walk through the stadium, hearing all that shit, the bus ride back, going to the plane, the shit decorated with L.A. gear. But I'm going to tell you something. Kobe was 6 for 24 that game. But this is how bad he wanted. Every team that won, that ga won the game in that series won the rebounding battle. Kobe had 15 motherfucking rebounds at the two-guard position. So that goes to... That's another testimony to his mm. greatness because yeah, people hard. always think everybody want to talk about uh, the scoring, but like he was off. But he said, you know he what? Would do what hey, he would do whatever. He would do whatever it takes to win. He had he had eight offensive rebounds that led mm. to him going to the free throw line. Like that's mm -hmm. that's what you, like motherfucker wanted that shit, man. And like today, man, since we thinking back on it. And and when we lost our brother, I ain't even just saying this because, you know, it's, it's a front. This is how I feel. When people ask me about that 2010 now, I'm at ease with it. I'm like, you know what? Shit. I, I, shit, Kobe could have that motherfucker, man. I'm glad yeah. he took it. Straight yeah. up. That's just the real one in me. I don't even, I'm not even, I don't think about it. I don't say what if. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm glad Kobe got his feel. I ain't even care if it was against us. Mm, yeah. That's real shit. Uh, 2010 summer, um, Miami forms their big three, their own big three. Uh, what are the, what's the reaction by you guys? Thoughts? Shit, shit, I don't know, man. I was long and gone. Motherfucker shipped me up out of there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so did I you got traded really... that summer? No, I got traded in January. I'm lying. So when they got, when they formed together, I was recovering off my ACL injury. So I didn't never get a chance to play with them. But we added okay. Shaq. 
we had a Shaq mm -hmm. and we had a J.O. And what happened mm -hmm. was, was that I had a, Danny offered me a contract extension. I was making four. He was like, here, Perk, I got a contract extension for you for six million a year. I was like, Dan, I can't take that. A starting center right now, I'm making anywhere from 10 to 15. So Danny knew it was a strong possibility I was going to walk. He traded, long story short, man, he traded me to OKC, knowing I was going to get paid there. I didn't play a game. Before I even played one game, man, they gave me a four-year, $36 million deal. So I was like, people always be mad at Danny, but Danny actually did me a favor. But yeah. when the big three, but That's when the big three. me. Yeah, man. When the big three, when the big three was formed in Miami, I was like, shit, this is about to be a motherfucking <laughs> problem. I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily scared of Chris Bosh because KG always gave him that work. You know what I'm saying? And for some reason, he took it personal when he played against Bosh. But, man, I ain't going to lie. Le LeBron and D-Wade pairing up, going against, like, kind of older Ray and a Paul, I was like, fuck, I don't know about that one, man. That's going to be a hard motherfucker to get across right there. Mm, tough. Well, you like you said, you go to a to a young OKC team that drafted really well and has ready to make noise of themselves. What were your first thoughts playing with that young squad? Because you guys had a lot of talent over there. Man, I was like, man, what the fuck? You know, I'm leaving Boston where I've been at my 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 brothers. I I wasn't feeling that shit, man. When I got into that motherfucker and I saw these young motherfuckers and how hard they work and how they was putting in that work. After back to backs practicing, going at each other, I was like, "Shit!" I didn't walk mm. into another gold mine. Hell, I just got to play my role. So I was, I walked in OKC on a strain MCL on my other leg. So I had a month to actually evaluate them and actually watch them up close. I was like, "Man, these some bad motherfuckers." If I just bring, <laughs> if I just bring this leadership right. in this motherfucker and preach roles, shit, man, we about to run. We about to make us a couple runs. And so we ended up going to the Western Conference, but I knew James was going to be special. I knew Russ was going to be special, and I damn sure knew KD was going to be special. All them guys, from the moment I saw them in the first two weeks, not just in the game, but how the motherfuckers prepared and how much time they put into the gym, I was like, nah, these motherfuckers is on a mission. What was the chemistry like with that team? All young stars. You come in as a little bit older player. You come in hurt, but you guys got a nice young roster. What, what, what was the vibe and energy like around that team? Man, I ain't going to lie. It was fucked up. It was fucked up when I first got there. Everyone was going their separate ways when I first got there, man. You know, you had one clique hanging over here, another clique hanging over there. So I walked in there, man, and I started actually, I started actually preaching roles in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, Nah, man, we ain't go. We ain't go do this. Like we go be together. I start forming team dinners. I'm like, look, they weren't guys that went out. I'm like, we go play Boo Ray in my hotel room. This is what we about to do. Matter of fact, all that flying your brother in or brothers or cousins or friends. Nah, man, we ain't doing that no more. We go fuck with each other. We go. Mm -hmm. We go go on the road and it's just gonna be us. All that breaking off. We gotta develop some type of chemistry off the court to make this shit carry on on the court. Man, I had a certain group of family members went speaking to other group of family members, and, and it was just like a... And I'm like, hold on, man. So that goes to show me it was a lot of shoe showing behind motherfuckers' back, motherfuckers saying this about them, and I nipped that shit in the bud, like, quick, like, nah. If we want to win, right. we blocking out all that outside bullshit straight up, and I'm coming here with that bullshit. And they gravitated towards me. Mm -hmm. And I had a guy like I had a guy like Nick Collison, who's one of my favorite motherfucking uh uh teammates of all time, help me out with that shit because he like, man, perk right. Like I called that shit out in the film room, like, hey, look here, man, all that outside shit, I don't know what's going on, but we ain't doing that shit no more. Straight up. That's big. I mean, that's, you know, that's coming from a veteran team and going to a young team, you know, with no right. real guidance. I love Nick Collison, uh, but he's probably, you know, he's probably not as outspoken. I'm sure it helped having you and then him to be able right. to stamp you because I know they all respected Nick because Nick was what the longest tenure uh, Sonic Rocket yep. there was, or excuse me, uh, uh, Thunder there were, right? Longest yeah. tenure. Yeah. Sonic, Sonic yeah. Thunder, yeah. yep. Mm hmm. So, now that's dope. You brought that kind of energy. It's important. 2011 NBA playoffs, you lose to Dallas in five. 
Mavs would go on to win it. How tough was it dealing with Dirk? He wasn't tough for us, but how tough was it dealing with Dirk for y'all? <laughs> See, well, we pissed him off. Y'all. We right. pissed him off. And look, that's all we did. Look, we had, man, we had a young surge, and myself, I had two motherfucking knee braces on like I was an offensive lineman because I had to wear a knee brace for the ACL <laughs> and MCL. Man, I ain't going to lie, Dirk gave us that motherfucking work, man. I'm talking about he was, man, he was in a zone where if he wasn't missing shots, he was getting to the free throw line. Like, he wasn't missing shots. It wasn't no missing for him. Yeah. I didn't give a damn how great of a contest you got or whatever the case may be. And he got to the free throw line. I think in that series, he probably averaged 22 to 23 free throw attempts a game. And they all was mm. fouled. That's how aggressive mm -hmm. he was. So he wasn't just selling, but he was a motherfucking problem. You could tell that year he was like, nah, it ain't no more taking this shit away from me, and I'm going out swinging, motherfucker. Like, mm -hmm. we could not stop him to save the life of us, and he and he knew that. Like, he was just on a mission. That's a bad boy. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 30,000 plus scored. Shoo! Say what you want. That motherfucker was bad, Oh, man. Dirk was a killer. Dirk was a killer. Man. All we did, all we did, was piss him off at Golden State. He yeah. had a whole different mindset but, after that. But, period. But y'all actually, but y'all actually had the bodies though. Y'all had it was yeah. you stack. Like y'all had the bodies yeah. to switch and <clears throat> aggravate him, and y'all was able to be able to get up under him, move y'all feet where he damn near couldn't get a shot off, or he could put that bitch on the ground around y'all because y'all was taking yeah. that shit. And on the other end, mm -hmm. who the fuck he was gonna guard? Y'all was the real right. true definition of going small. Y'all said that shit from the jump. Y'all was like, motherfucker, right. we about to get up and down. Your motherfucking go, your motherfucking ass gonna have to slide these your puppies. And that's y'all was <laughs> man shit. That was a fun ass series though, real talk. Yeah. 2012 playoffs. You and Jack meet in the Western Conference Finals. Memories mm. from both you guys on that series. Golden Triangle stand up, man. That was a man. good moment, man. I, I I was able to get back to San Antonio. And uh, you know, I remember, I remember that that uh, I thought I was gonna get my second chip, man, in San Antonio. And one thing about it, every time I've been in San Antonio, Matt, we went to the Western Conference Finals at least. You dig yep. what I'm saying? But uh, but uh, but uh, we won the first two games, Matt. Uh, we got up to a good start. I think uh, we was riding Tim. You know, Tim was making the right plays. Making, you know, he wasn't really scoring too much, but he was just making the right plays. You know, Tim, he gonna do everything right. You come double him, he gonna, he not gonna force it. He gonna let you double him, and make the right plays. So the first two games, we was doing all that. Uh, second two games, KD and Russ just turned up on another level, dog. I mean, me and Kawhi was playing good D on them, but they were just making plays to the point where we went up two, and it ended up being a tie series. I mean, uh, it, it ended up being a tie series game six. For them to uh, send us home, and uh, I was on five, Matt. I come out six, six threes. I'm talking Ooh, about like I, could, I couldn't miss. I couldn't, couldn't miss, man. I'm talking about on five. And Tony Parker, here he go with trying to get MVP. He starts trying to do it himself. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he was trying to compete. Hey. He was trying to compete with Russ. Yeah, that didn't I, work, Matt. Next thing you know, KD hot. The next thing you know, James got hot. And and, and once and once Russ in his bag, KD hot. Now you got James come in. We couldn't do nothing with them, dog, and they, and, they, and they was able to end up going to the finals that year. But that, that was a good experience for me because not only playing against them, but going to the game, seeing uh, Van and them at the games, you know what I'm saying, being able to see them after the games. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and where we both come from, it, it right. was just crazy, man. We both in the Western Conference Finals. We got the same – like, it, it was just it was just a great moment, dog. Win or lose, it was a great moment for me. Yeah, Texas yeah, it was boys. for me too, Matt. Because look, at the end of the day, we both had already won rings, so it wasn't like we was chasing our first title, but we was trying to right. get that second one. And then, mm -hmm. you know, to go against my brother in the film room, we had Jack as as like that motherfucker that like we we had to get a focus on because we was like, man, we cannot let Jack be this third option and, and get going. Although he did get going, that motherfucker couldn't miss, and I think it was in. Game six, we was like, what the fuck? But he had a good series going on, period. I'm going to tell you, Jack ain't telling no lies, Matt, no bullshit. So the first two games in San Antonio, we was playing the pick and roll regular. Well, we was dropping in coverage, and Tony Parker was actually being able to come downhill at me, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to do shit because I was in the drop. Mm -hmm. 
I went, we down 0-2. I'm fucked up. I'm like, man, them niggas got me fucked up. I'm hearing Steve Kerr talk shit. I go back and watch the game. And I want to listen to the bullshit. I hear Steve Kerr tell the motherfucker they should take me out the lineup. The perk can't guard the pick and roll. I go in that motherfucking film room and tell Scotty, hey, look, man, we switching everything. We came in that motherfucker and we switched them motherfuckers. It all went bad. Because I knew once they saw the switch with Tony Parker, and I came out in game three, and we switched the, the pick and roll. First, I switched out on Tony Parker. I clapped my motherfucking hands like, let me see that motherfucker. Gave him space. He tried to pull up on me. I blocked that shit. Took that shit. Then Ginobili came down, tried to do the same in the pick and roll. And I remember that uh, Pop was hot. He called the timeout. I looked at the uh, the uh, commentating table over there. Steve Kerr was like, oh, ho-ass nigga, what you was saying? I'm hot. I'm hot because <laughs> I, already, I already heard it. So I'm, I'm in my mind like, motherfucker, Hell you yeah, got me line, fucked dog. up. So yep. we right then, we switched up, and they didn't even know it. They didn't even make no adjustments. Instead of them going to the post with a, with, with Tim Duncan with or, or Swindon, right. with the right. switch. Tony was going T at the mismatch, dog, and that was T all bad. And all, all we said was is that we going to get – me and Serge said we going to give him space, and we going to make him take a tough contested two, and that motherfucker started clanking that motherfucker off the side of the rim and back, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. Straight <laughs> up, bro. Straight up. And that's how it went. But I, at that moment, it was just cool, man, because all our families was there. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just like, it's, it's, it's stacked going. Like, at, at that point, you want stack that. I wanted stack to have a good game. I wanted to have a good game yeah. and shit. In game four, I kind of win that. I kind of win that Tim a little bit. I had me a little 15 and 9, 12 in the yeah. first quarter. I kind of yeah. set the tone early, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I went at Tim a little bit. I used to, because I yeah. used to, I used to be like, man, fuck all this nice guy shit. Tim, he he he, Tim Duncan, but I used to pick fights with him. Jack could tell you, motherfucker used yeah. to push him, yeah. throw elbows. Yeah. I would never rattle him, but I used to just try to, like, motherfucker, you go do something today, motherfucker, fight you back. You gonna earn it tonight. <laughs> yeah, you but gonna he earn used to fight back. He ain't talk no shit, but that <laughs> motherfucker give you that work. Yeah, no, no sir. question about that. So you guys knock out San Antonio and play the big three. What was that experience like? Because that was your young Bucks' first taste of the finals. Uh, that's Bron's first ring, obviously. But what was that experience like being with a young OKC team and winning it as a youngster with a veteran-driven Boston team? Man, look, it, it was different. And I saw, I saw it because after we won – the conference finals, I saw the energy in everybody and they had act like we won the championship. And you expect that out of some young guys, but I'm like, man, we got these motherfuckers who over here waiting on us, who waiting for their first title run with a veteran team of Mike Miller, James Jones. Like, you know, they got all these motherfuckers who chasing they, they hard well. So we end up getting game one. They got game two. But when we went to Miami, man, we could not get a win to save our life, man. Russ and, Russ and James came to play. I remember I had a couple double-doubles. I mean, Russ and KD came to play. I had a couple double-doubles. Serge was doing pretty good. But, man, James ain't give us shit. And you know why. <laughs> <laughs> motherfucking, yeah. motherfucking king of diamonds and everything caught a hole in his ass, man. We couldn't get a win. <laughs> See, in San Antonio, look. In San Antonio, he didn't have a damn thing to do. Shit, yeah, motherfucker, he was we got cooking. to my Yeah, we got to motherfucker Miami shit. It was everything motherfucker do. We couldn't get that motherfucker to buy a bucket in that motherfucker. <laughs> he sure was <laughs> killing us in San Antonio, bro. God damn. That's tough. Yeah, he had That's to tough. get his rest. In Miami, he couldn't get his rest. Motherfucker was out here <laughs> motherfucking night. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said he couldn't get his rest. So your career's uh, winding down. You get a, a stop in Cleveland to play with LeBron side by side. You get a stop and get to play with a young AD. Tell me what playing with those two uh, were like on your way out. Well, you know, I've been knowing LeBron since I was about, shit, 12. Class 03, whether we was playing against each other, or we played, whether we was at ABCD camp, whether we played on the same Oakland Soldier team. So I've been knowing LeBron. And I've been knowing the sacrificing that he was putting in. This motherfucker was eating fruit 
and shit when we was in the ninth grade before between games. You know how you play seven games in a day sometimes go eat some and go eat McDonald's. This motherfucker had yeah. fruit and water. He was already ahead of the curve before all of us. But but actually going on the team and watching this motherfucker and how he go how he went about his day, I was like, man, I don't see how he do it. Like this motherfucker will wake up at five, work out with his strength and conditioning coach, get there early to the gym, be the first person in there blasting whatever new music is out, working out that motherfucker, practice hard in the motherfucker, get shots up with his teammates, get treatment, probably have a motherfucking commercial to go do, find time to go home, you know, spend a couple hours, have dinner with the family. Hey, Perk, what you doing? Nothing, I ain't doing shit. Hey, come over, let's watch this game. All right, cool, I'm over there. Go to watch the game with him, pull up, he getting treatment again. Same thing on the road. Like, we in five-star steakhouses. This motherfucker got his trainer with him, getting ice and stem on whatever was bothering him. And he had a he had a rule. Like, shit, he was going to bed at, at 10.30. He didn't give a fuck what nobody was talking about. 10.30, 11 o'clock, he shutting it down. And so I'm watching how this motherfucker basically got a schedule like the president, the sacrificing he putting in, that nobody see behind the scenes. And I'm mm-hmm. like, shit, this is why this motherfucker who he is. Like, this is why he, this is why he, who he is. So when people say, yeah, he invested $2 million in his body, hell yeah, because I was front row and I saw that shit. This motherfucker was, was getting it in, man. Like, you know, I got much, I, I, I had another level of respect for how he conducted himself and how he handled himself for us with the media, far as with, with, with how he move and how he travel, how, you know, he was still a- interacting. This motherfucker go gamble and play cards like a motherfucker. He go do, you know, he, he a cool motherfucker. But when he get in front of the cameras, he knew he was, a, he know he's an icon and he had that mm-hmm. on and off switch like no one else I ever seen in life. Mm-hmm. That's deep. What did you see in a young AD uh, over in New Orleans? Man, I ain't gonna lie. I got there, man. I said, man, this motherfucker is different. He's one of one. He might be. I haven't saw anybody like him since probably KG. That that could do what he do for us, bringing on the court. He didn't have that. He don't have that raw raw tenacity. But he had. I'm talking about the game, the the handles, the offensive package. And the first thing I said was like, man, this city ain't big enough for him. That motherfucker got to get up out of here. <laughs> I was I was thinking that from the jump. Like, shit, AD got to get somewhere. With, because, you know, he had his own shoe line out. I was like, man, AD got to get somewhere that that he's going to be able to be marketable because he is and have those, those bright lights really shine on him for, for people to really know his value. Because while he was in New Orleans, I think a lot of people, not us, as basketball peers, but the casuals, we underappreciated what Anthony Davis brought to the table because of the market that he was in. So when you get a chance to kind of reflect on your career, I'm going to list some names of players you play with. I'm sure there's more, but these are some of the top players. Just tell me what you, when you, when you get a chance to reflect, you think. You got to play with Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Ray John Rondo, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, and Anthony Davis. Damn! When you, when you get a chance, best to look back and reflect on all that. What what do you what comes to mind? Shit, I was a motherfucking male groupie, hoopy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. like, like I'm just saying those, those some real That's a hell shit, of a man, list. To, to be blessed to play with that many Hall of Famers, man. I the one thing I would I say that I never did though is I never took playing with the motherfuckers for granted. I never took it for granted. I always cherished that moment, and I was okay with being Mr. Three Points and Four Rebounds because I had some bad motherfuckers I played with, and I knew my role, you know? And so, man, it was just, it was a blessing, man, just to see different types at different ages. You know, with KG, Paul, and Ray was kind of older. Then watching Russ and and James and, 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 uh, KD as they were young studs and then going watch how LeBron conducted himself going with AD and I also played with the old school Gary Payton and was Shaq teammate for a little mm-hmm. bit you know what I'm saying so it's just yeah, like man yeah. I got to watch that and then when you look at Paul 
You know, I feel like Paul is underappreciated, man, in my eyes. Because uh, Paul was a fucking killer, man. They don't, Paul people was a don't, killer. Yeah, man. He was a fucking killer. killer, man. And look, just think about this. In 08, when we had to go, when we won that motherfucking ring, man, Paul ain't back down to now motherfucker. He, he had to go mm -hmm. through Joe Johnson the first round. We all know about Iso Joe and what he did mm -hmm. with the Hawks and how he was on the tear. Next next round, he had to face uh he had to face who we saw in the second round. Oh, he had to face LeBron James. Him and Braun went there all the way to a game seven with Braun and him going toe to toe. Then we went against the Pistons, mm -hmm. Chauncey, Tayshawn mm -hmm. Prince, and Rip Hamilton. Paul held his own in, in that series and then to end up and go against the late great Kobe Bryant and win that ring in the Celtic and Laker uh, rivalry in the finals mm. and come out finals MVP, man, that's a hell mm. of a motherfucking run hell to yeah. say especially, yeah. to say especially, shit, he at the top of all the motherfucking categories in the Celtic uh, franchise books. So, you know, people just don't give Paul enough credit because they see Paul as the analyst. But if these, this younger generation go back and watch Paul in his younger motherfucking days when, when Shaq that's gave true. him the name Truth, Man, they got P fucked up. Yeah, for mm -hmm. real. He was one of my hardest guards for sure. No question. Two questions on that front. Who who did you enjoy playing against the most, and who was your who you look forward to guarding? Who I look forward to guarding was Yao Ming. Mm -hmm. Yao Ming was a motherfucker. See, people don't understand, man. Yao Ming was seven six, and had really. Offensively, he didn't have no flaws because he could shoot the 15, he could face mm -hmm. up, he was strong, he he'll turn, ball. drop step. Yeah, he'll dunk on you and all that shit. He was a challenge. And so mm -hmm. I used to want that matchup 101 to see where I was at. And, and especially when we played in Houston, going back to the crib, where a motherfucker had to buy 100 tickets for family and friends. I'm damn sure not about to get shown up. So that was one of my biggest challenges. But that I that I used to look forward to because I wanted to see what it was like. I wanted to see what it was. You know what I'm saying? And I held my own, but man, I ain't gonna lie. The biggest challenge for me was going against Zebo, dog. Zach Randolph. Cause I I Zebo. I, I ain't have two motherfuckers that was ready to go back at me like that, talk shit, and Big boy a fight and, and a and a fight went with that. Like motherfucker. <laughs> then we can lead the back by the bus. Ah, straight so, up. So it, yeah, so up. it was different for me. So I'm like, shit, straight this motherfucker up. ain't backing down. He talking shit. This motherfucker bite it just as heavy and strong as I am. And I always had problems. So I started, he was the only guy, no, no bullshit. He was the only guy that I actually fronted on the post and denied so he wouldn't get the ball. Hmm. No, Zach was Zach was a walking double double, twenty and ten. Yeah, easy. So now, since you've made a successful transition into media, like I said, being one of the most prominent voices, uh, why is it so important for you to utilize your voice and your platform, not only in sports but just in the in 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 what do I want to say in the current climate of uh, of our country? Well, well, first of all, I, I just follow, I follow, I follow Jack Lee. I follow everybody Lee because I, I tell you something, man. Like jumping into that 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 media space and you you're talking about basketball, it's so much for me to learn that I got to learn for us when it comes down to in social justice and how to approach things. So one thing a motherfucker can't do is tell me what to say. So you know, especially in the right. world today, we have the right, every right in the world now to speak our voice. And it be times that I can't get out there or, or, you know what I'm saying, I see Jack traveling and part of me, I need to be there, but I'm over here with my wife and my four kids trying to make this living. And Jack could tell you, man, I, shit, I didn't hit them up like, hey, look, I can't be there, bro, but shit, let me know what I could donate to or yeah. whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. But I feel like it's definitely important oh, with, me, with me having a platform the least I could do is speak on shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is the least I could do is speak on shit and say, you know what, hey man, that shit ain't right. This motherfucker ain't the right person. Let's tell the motherfucker on how I feel. Use this platform. I don't have a million followers, but I got enough followers that I could affect some motherfucker life and say something out there. So 
You know, that's what I push for, man. And here's the crazy thing is that the thing that I don't like the most about what's going on is it, it, in, in our world for us, like, especially in the African-American community, is that we tend to judge one another. And that ain't cool. Like, my thing is, is that long as we all fighting for the right cause and everybody heart is in the right place, support your brother and whatever that he's doing. Don't judge a motherfucker about how he's going about doing something. And I tell people that about any person, whether it's Jack, whether it's Braun, whether it's you, Matt, or whoever. How they doing it, let them do it how they want to do it because they all, at the end of the day, we all fighting for the same cause. I don't yeah. give a fuck what it is. Let them right. do it how they do it. As long as you know them motherfuckers heart is in the right place, I'm right cool place. with that. And, be, and people be so quick, oh man, why why he so outspoken? Why he doing this? God damn, if that man want to use his motherfucking platform and be outspoken about shit that need to be talked about, motherfucker, let him mm -hmm. do it. Fall the fuck back. Just yep. because he ain't just because he ain't doing it your motherfucking way don't mean it ain't right. 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 No, let yeah, let let, let Jack be Jack. Let Matt be Matt. Let everybody be who everybody, long as we fight for the same right cause and you can see a motherfucker heart is in the right place, let them do them, man. Yeah, I can, I, I, I can, I, I probably ran out of fingers counting how many times I didn't seen Perk on ESPN, you know, basically just cut this show off and give me props for what I've been doing. But I think, I, I appreciate it, but I think the thing with me is I don't care who get credit. You know what I'm saying? Right, it's too many right. people. It's too many people worrying about who get credit for change, and we all want it. We all fight for the same thing. So it don't matter who the face of it. It don't matter who get credit for it. Just as long as we all fight for the same thing, and we compete too much in our race. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we we, we compete entirely too much. You know what I mean? And, and that's some of the biggest problems that's holding us back, bro. That shit don't make no damn sense, man. And like I told people, I said I, I be telling people about you all the time. Stack is that. People don't understand your relationship with George Floyd. God rest his soul, man. People don't understand that relationship. And, and sometimes you don't know what level you will take it to until that shit really hit home, hit close to home. Happen. And then yeah. you, you don't know you don't know what, where to push that button for you to take it to a whole nother level where it's like, nah, fuck that. Fuck everything I'm doing right now. I'm going to stand for this motherfucking shit until it hit close mm -hmm. to home. And I always say we always live in a world of thinking shit can't happen to us or shit can't happen to people that's close to us. And we need to quit doing that because yep. shit can happen to us, bro. Real mm -hmm. talk. Absolutely. Don't wait to hit your doorstep. That's why I think 2020 has shown us. All right, man. Well, this has been an amazing interview, man. But we're coming down man, the stretch to our, to, our, man. To, our, to our quick hitters. Jack, start them off with the quick hitters. All right, top five big men of all time, in your opinion? Oh, you gotta, you gotta put Shaq in there. You gotta put Shaq. Mm -hmm. You gotta put Kareem. Uh, mm -hmm. You gotta put Bill Russell. The, see, it, here's the mm. tricky part. Here's the tricky part when it comes down with me. I didn't, I ain't never. Out of respect, you gotta put Will Chamberlain in there. I never saw Will Chamberlain. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I never saw. But he Will did Chamberlain, score 100 points. He did score 100 <sighs> points, and it's. His numbers was insane, and when I but think my of only Big thing, Man, my, not to cut you off real quick, Perk. My whole thing with with the Chamberlain thing, obviously respect is paid because his numbers were video game numbers, but I just think the average talent back then wasn't. You know what I mean? Like to me, I think he still would have been a really good player if you got to play with other mountains like Shaq and Elijah Wan and Morning and Ewing and all these other dudes that are similar to his size, but he never really got that. Now, Grant, but like I'm I said, saying, oh, oh, video game oh Matt, 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 you was talking uh, about his hoop numbers. I wasn't talking oh, yeah. about his hoop numbers. He was talking about that. <laughs> that, 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 that. <laughs> yeah, he's his man. I'm talking about it off talking the about court yeah. numbers. Yeah, that, that's yeah. just hot. That's I, top five all alone. Ain't nobody gonna ever beat this. Hey, hey, look, that motherfucker well, Kareem, <laughs> that motherfucker Will Chamberlain was playing against against motherfuckers who was dribbling the ball like nobody this around the court that, with one right hand, man. I, that's why I ain't really so. <laughs> Uh, I ain't so, but then, but then you got to put a in there. That's my top yep. five bigs. Absolutely, you can't, you can't leave dream. dream out. Yeah. Uh, uh. 
So you plus four nah, going to play a pickup no. game in the park. Who? What four would you take, retired or uh, current players? I'm plus – what you say? I'm plus four, right? Me plus so, four? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You plus four going to play a pickup game in the park. Yeah, you plus four. In the park? In the park? Shit. In the park, yeah. Man, no no bullshit. Give me I, – I, me at the center, Zach Randolph at the four. Give me Matt Barnes at the two, Jack at the three, motherfucking, and give me uh, – Man, shit, give me Rondo at the point. I need goons. If we going to the motherfucking park, us five, we going to go that motherfucking fit right in. Because the park ain't... Win the park, the, the, well, the first thing is, is that the park ain't about to be full of no league motherfuckers. That's the first thing. So we already got the advantage. And two, we going to need some yep. motherfuckers who, one, going to be ready to get down and dirty and going to be ready to scrap if we motherfucking have to. <laughs> and I need to bring four motherfuckers that I know that's going to swing <laughs> <laughs> Facts. Facts. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, here we go. One NBA yeah. player. One NBA player you wish you could have played with. That you did play with. Which, I mean, you damn near played with everybody. So I don't know how you go answer this question. But name somebody you, that you wish you could have played with that you didn't. Oh. Uh. Oh. Motherfucker played with a lot of superstars. Well, obviously, obviously That's what I said. Jack, he played with everybody. Now, nah, I wish me and Jack could have, because our four nine connection, but that, oh, that's, yeah, uh, that that's already dope. known. But I, you know what? I, I, I wish I could have played with motherfucking, uh, I wish I could have played with T-Mac, man. I ain't going to lie, mm. man. T-Mac T was before his time. Like, T-Mac was borderline KD before KD. Like, you know what I'm yeah, saying? T-Mac like, used to punish me, dog. Yeah, like he dealt with some injuries, but Mac was a motherfucker, man. 6'10 at that two guard, he was a motherfucker. Yeah. And that, how that, high that, he jumped. And how high he got up off the floor. The, the, yeah. But how high he jumped on his jumpers. Like, you could, there's nothing you could do with that man. Get by you, dunk on the whole team. Mac was a killer. Killer. Straight up killer. Uh, five five dinner guests, dead or alive. Man, you know what? Kobe, because I I, I want to like you always want to know what's going on in, in in Kobe mind, right? Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying. I wanted to know what I, I wanted to know what he was thinking. I wanted to know his approach. The one time I did meet him, man, it was like real mo a real motherfucker in Vegas. But Kobe, uh, Magic. Cause, Cause, magic just feel like he just, he got, he brings so much life. Like it feel like if you having a bad motherfucking day, he feel like he gonna be them. It's that motherfucker Uplifted. who gonna make you forget about everything that you motherfucker was going through and go shine some light on your motherfucking day. Um, mm -hmm. Bill Russell, man, Bill Russell mm -hmm. seemed like a funny motherfucker. Every time you hear him on interviews, he's always talking shit to a motherfucker or saying how he would have bust somebody ass. Like, I, I want to sit down with old school and hear him talk about those stories. And then, number four is a guy that's playing right now, man. He's seen, he, he, I just haven't seen a 7'6 guy like this with this much swag, and that's that's Taco Fall. Big Taco Fall is a different... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, Big Taco, a different type of dude, man, and, and he's interesting, man. He dressed, <laughs> yeah, dog, he dressed with swag. He be working on this game like he a guard or some shit. Like, I want to know what's going on with Big Taco. So, him, and I want to, I, 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 shit, I want to I wanna sit down, man, with Dame Dollar, dog. Dame Dollar seemed mm. like a real motherfucker, dog. Dame Dollar is a motherfucker like I just want to kick it with, pick his brain, mm -hmm. see what he talking about, go in the lab, him. <laughs> He um dropped them bars and shit. That's it though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, last Straight question. Up. Last question. All right, who do you want to see on All the Smoke? But before you answer this question, your answer you have to help us with your answer. Shannon Sharp ain't been on All the Smoke, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah. he has. We had yeah, him in has. studio too. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. You damn right. You damn he right. Came, he, he, damn he came to the interview. He came to the interview in some spandex. You damn right. You damn right. He was on that motherfucker, man. I'm trying to think. Shit, y'all didn't had all the powerful motherfuckers on here. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Real talk though. Uh, shit, who would I? Who would I want to see y'all interact with, man? You know what? I'm. I'm gonna say this, and it's gonna fuck y'all head up. I want to see y'all dive deep 
with a motherfucker who then lost a lot of respect with me. I want to see y'all bring him on, Matt, Steve, my brothers, my partners, my family. I want y'all to bring on Jason Whitlock. Bring on Jason Whitlock and y'all two, and I want to hear that conversation. I want it, I want you two motherfuckers to put y'all pride aside because y'all feel the same way I feel about them. Bring them on. And mo I, I know. Bring them on and you two motherfuckers have an in-depth conversation. Put y'all pride aside and give the audience big perk mm. what they want. I want to hear that motherfucking conversation. Because y'all, look, but, the way y'all feel about them, I feel, the same, I feel the, the same way. The question ain't if we going to do it. The question is he going to do it. He talks so much he shit. Gonna, he ain't going to... But he, he won't. He so won't put himself in that line of fire. He not gonna put himself in that line of fire. He might do it. He I'm, might do it virtually. He, he might do it like this. He might do yeah, it. He might social he'll distance. do it virtually. He do it virtually because he know a motherfucker can't put them paws on them over through the motherfucking computer. <laughs> but shit, that's that's I what got, I want to see. I got, I got a lot home. of respect for. Him. I got a lot of respect for him as far as you know. what I'm saying open the opening the door and give me the opportunity on the show. But on his show, Matt to tell you, man, Matt to been on the show this together. On his show, we ne I never agree with nothing he said because it seemed like he went on the he went opposite against us on purpose. And right. I just clown Pur to me. Purpose, and, purposely. And, 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 and see, that's why I think that's why I think bringing him on would be great. That's why I think it would be great. Mm -hmm. Like man. motherfucker, let's let's have a sit down. down. Let's keep it one hundred. Motherfucker, what's up? What's happening? What's I, on your mind? I, Here we go. I I'd rather bring Derek on the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, Perk, man, thank you, man. This is one of the most inter entertaining interviews we've had. <laughs> Y'all niggas is crazy. Hey, man, man that's you a right. fool hey, for man. that one, man. Hey, but thank you, Perk, man. We appreciate nah, your time. Appreciate that's a wrap. Out, man. You can catch this episode Love you, bro. of Showtime Basketball YouTube. Love y'all, man. I appreciate it. I heart platform. I'm happy Perk, for y'all, man. man. Keep you, it going. Hey, love keep you, setting that example for everybody, man. Straight up. I love y'all, man. When the camera's rolling, the heart pounds. It's thrilling to me.